Hi everyone, welcome to our first week online in Consumer Be Behavior MKTG 350. I hope everybody is um, healthy and staying safe. And uh, if I can do anything to help you through this uh, process, just let me know, okay? And uh, I'll do anything I can to try to accommodate uh, what's going on with you personally, but you just need to reach out and let me know. All right, so let's just uh, talk about where we are here. So we are in week uh, 10, which is really week 11, but uh, uh, actually it is week 10, um, 323. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about attitude this week. So uh, attitude is covered in chapter eight. And the extension on the homework for chapter eight, I'll uh, extend that to um, next week so you have uh, some additional time to do that homework. I don't think I've done that yet, but I'll make sure to do it. Um, uh, just a note about uh, the change in the project. So originally it was gonna be a team project, but now what we are going to do is a uh, research paper. Each person would be responsible for completing their own research paper. And I sent you an email yesterday that had some outlines in there about what was uh, required. So it is due at the end of the semester on um, Sunday, April 26th by midnight. And there's five different topics. You could pick one topic to explore. You're going to look at a current trend in consumer behavior. Um, and you think about secondary scholarly research in current social trends and mark from marketing research sources like Mintel. I'm looking for a five to seven page <clears throat> double spaced paper um, and you can add an appendix that would include your tables and graphs um, and make sure that you have at least five citations in there, five sources that uh, provide some background research for your paper. Uh, let me know what choice of topic that you're going to select. Uh, these are the five different choices. So you can look at a packaging design and perception idea. Uh, you can look at uh, nostalgia and memory and how it, that uh, impacts consumption. Uh, there's a lot of talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and whether or not that's obsolete. So you could do some investigation into that. Uh, the other two topics are male sex concept and identity. So you want to think about, you know, how men are changing the way they view their own self-concept. And then the last one is social media and the future of privacy, which is always a hot topic. So pick one of those topics, five to seven pages, and uh, you need to do some background research on that. And uh, let me know again which one you're gonna pick. I'll, I'll uh, post at my courses a complete um, directions on, on what we would be thinking about here expectations on the paper. All right, so let's talk about attitude a little bit. <clears throat> There's a number of topics we're going to cover in this video, and I'll, I'll uh, post another one or two videos that complete this topic. I don't want to do them all at, at once. It would make it for too long of a video. So we'll look at the definition of attitude. Attitudes are made up of three components, and we'll look at all three components and discuss those. <clears throat> we'll think about how people form attitudes, and they do it in a, a number of different ways, and we'll check that out. Um, and people tend to want to maintain consistency among all of the attitudinal components. So in other words, they want to believe and feel either positively or negatively both about a particular object or product or brand, whatever we're talking about in terms of what the attitude is directed toward. Um, and so people like to maintain consistency among those components, and we'll take a look at how that happens. Um, and then the last thing we'll look at uh, is why inconsistencies in attitude components can easily occur. And it, that is what makes it hard for marketers to actually measure attitudes, especially uh, behavioral aspects of attitudes. So this is what we'll look at, and I will um, go through a number of these topics here today. So first of all, let's just make sure that we look at, as always, the official definition of attitude, an enduring organization of motivational, 
emotional, perceptual, and cognitive processes uh, with respect to some aspect of our environment. Um, so we have attitudes about many things. Attitudes are really difficult to change, uh, and let's investigate why. So first of all, there's a stimuli that comes into your area of exposure that you're exposed to, um, and that stimuli initiates uh, three different components, if in fact you pay attention. So there's an affective component, and that's the emotions or feelings that you have about a particular object or idea or product. The second one is cognitive. And the cognitive component is about the beliefs that you have with respect to a particular product or uh, idea. And then the last one is behavioral, and that is your intentions with respect to the actual product, idea, et cetera. So intentions might be, am I going to buy this thing? Am I going to uh, borrow it from my friend and try it out? What would be your behavioral intentions with respect to that particular stimuli? All of those three components go into making up the overall orientation toward the object, and that becomes the attitude. So let's look at Crest toothpaste for a minute. The affective aspect of Crest toothpaste could be I like Crest as a toothpaste. In other words, you feel good about Crest. The second uh, aspect, your cognition with respect to Crest, that would be your beliefs about Crest toothpaste. So one belief might be Crest prevents cavities. And then behaviorally, you might say, I intend to buy Crest. So this would be a harmonious uh, balance between the three elements of an attitude. You like it you know something good about it, and you intend to act positively toward the item. Attitudes can serve functions. And uh, according to research, there are four different types of functions that attitude can serve up for consumers and help them make decisions about particular products or brands or ideas that they're faced with on a regular basis. So there are, uh, uh, functional aspects of attitudes when it comes to you. utility. Um, the utilitarian function relates to the basic principles of reward and punishment. So you might develop some attitudes toward a product because you feel uh, positive about it, it makes you feel good, or perhaps you feel negative about it. It might cause you pad pain or sadness. A couple of examples here, so a spa, you might serve as a utilitarian function. A spa says um, you would be, receive pleasure there. A coffin, um, the functional attitude there would be sadness or pain because if you had to go pick out a coffin, that wouldn't be you know, a very positive experience. The value expressive function of an attitude. So here, here's where um, an attitude can provide me with the ability to communicate uh, my particular values about something. Um, so a person forms a product attitude in this case because of what the product says about him or her as a person. And so if you think about Dunkin Donuts versus Starbucks, people that go and buy their coffee regularly from Dunkin Donuts that might relate a particular value that you're a regular kind of person, you're kind of middle class, and you're not particularly fancy when it comes to your, uh, you know, um, coffee products. Starbucks, on the other hand, might make a statement about you that you're more upscale and you, you know, you want to uh, explore a variety when it comes to different coffee products and you want to make a statement about yourself as somebody that's kind of, you know, with it, whatever. So value expressive functions allow you to make statements about yourself. An ego defensive function, this is where you form an attitude to protect yourself, uh, perhaps from external threats, or maybe you've got insecurities, internal feelings of insecurity that you might have. Uh, so the, the, the attitude might provide you with an ego defensive function. So an example of a product here would be 
instant coffee. Um, in the 1950s, instant coffee came about and uh, housewives at that time formulated a very negative attitude towards instant coffee. And the reason for that was because in the 1950s, women were typically housewives and their job, their function, um, was to take care of their family. Uh, prepare breakfast in the morning, make sure that the coffee was ready, et cetera. Now instant coffee comes along and it, and it in, implicitly, didn't necessarily, but implicitly it displaced the housewife's duty. So in other words, if the husband could go and make his own coffee by boiling water and scooping a couple of scoops of Folgers into a cup, all of a sudden she wasn't really needed anymore. So she had a negative attitude. She was defensive about instant coffee. The last function is a knowledge function. And sometimes you form attitudes because you need to have order or structure around making different decisions. Um, so in other words, you might have a knowledge function that makes uh, up for the fact that you're in an ambiguous situation. So an example here would be uh, let's say that you believed that the only there was no difference between any cola products. So Coca-Cola was just as good as Pepsi Cola, was just as good as the store brand, was just as good as RC Cola, no difference whatsoever. So that knowledge of cola from your perspective would uh, provide you with the structure around how to make the decision of which one to purchase. And what you would do is base your decision on price. So if there's no difference between any of those cola products, you would buy based on the least expensive one. So <clears throat> here's the, uh, the recap of those uh, functional aspects of attitude. Uh, the textbook goes into quite a bit of detail on these four different functions of attitude, and you ought to um, check that out. So how do we form an attitude? An attitude is formed in a sequence of events. And it has to do with um, whether or not you form feelings first or beliefs first or actually take action first. Um, so the impact and importance of an attitude's components depends on your motivation towards the actual object. In other words, are you highly involved in making this decision? to purchase something or is it a low level of involvement? Um, if you were purchasing an iPhone, you probably would be highly involved. If you were purchasing laundry detergent, you probably wouldn't spend a lot of time thinking about that. So the standard learning hierarchy is one in which you form beliefs first, cognition occurs first, uh, then you form feelings toward the object, and then you act. So this would be an attitude based on cognitive information processing. Uh, this is the traditional approach to the hierarchies of effects. And this is the way marketers for a long time thought people formed attitudes. But then based on more research, they realized that uh, in fact, people also went through different uh, procedures in order to form an attitude. In a low involvement hierarchy, you might have beliefs first and then go and act on those beliefs and then form feelings afterwards. So in other words, you're not that involved in buying paper towel. Uh, you saw an advertisement for um, some type of paper towel on television that said it was double ply or something like that that caught your attention. You went and bought it at the store, you tried it out, and then you decided whether you liked it or not. So you used the, those beliefs about the product to drive your behavior. The last one is called an experiential hierarchy. Here's where you have feelings first, you act on those feelings, and then you form beliefs based on some hedonic consumption. So an example of this would be you're stressed out, you're tired from you know, many hours of work, um, so you see an ad on television for some tropical island vacation and you form feelings about that. Oh, I would love to go. It would be so relaxing. You actually make 
uh, your reservations based on those feelings. You go experience a place and then you form beliefs based on actually going to the resort. So you might um, have a huge amount of desire to go on vacation. You go on vacation, you stay at a resort and it's a great place and they have all kinds of activities and they kept you at active and busy, et cetera. And you formed a positive attitude based on your hedonic consumption of that resort. Cognitive dissonance occurs when there is a lack of harmony between the three elements of an attitude. So um, all of a sudden I'm confronted with inconsistencies among my beliefs versus my feelings versus my intentions or behaviors. And when a consumer feels this discomfort, they typically will take action to resolve that dissonance. So uh, 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 Famous example, of course, is smoking. Um, you believe, you know that smoking can cause cancer. Uh, it makes your skin um, gray. It makes your clothes smell. There's all kinds of negative beliefs and um, data points about uh, smoking. However, when you talk to a smoker, they tell you that I know that it causes cancer. However, I feel really relaxed. I love to have a cigarette. It makes me feel um, less stressed, et cetera. Um, and so I smoke, but there's a dissonance there, right? They, they believe negative things, but they feel positive things about uh, smoking, smoking. So what they typically will try to do is resolve that dissonance through different actions. For example, they might cut back on the number of cigarettes they smoke, uh, they might eat more healthy, they might exercise more. People will try to reduce that dissonance. The last part of this um, little discussion um, covers this fact, these factors that could account for inconsistencies that marketers cannot measure. It's really hard to measure these things. So in other words, um, I might love BMWs, I might think that they're the best performing car on the market, that they uh, are really, they have a great style, the engine is uh, really um, uh, productive, low gas mileage, but I don't need a, a BMW. So I might have positive beliefs and positive feelings about BMWs, but I don't, I don't go and buy one because I don't need one. Um, I also might have positive feelings and beliefs about a BMW, but I can't afford one. So there could be a factor of uh, an inability to actually go and purchase a car like that. Um, you might also have a situation where the marketer fails to consider relative attitudes. So in other words, I might feel good about BMWs. I might know that they're a great performing car. However, I think Audis are better looking cars. And so I'm gonna go buy an Audi. Number four, weekly held beliefs and attitude. I might think they're beautiful cars, uh, that is the BMW again, and I might um, believe that they're great performing cars, but honestly, I don't really care too much about cars, so even if I think they're great, it doesn't really matter. Um, number five, interpersonal influence. I might love BMWs, I might think they're the most beautiful car on the road, uh, but my husband hates them. And so, you know, it's a family car, so we have to buy something that uh, we both can agree on. Uh, situational factors, I might love BMWs. I might think they're a great performing car, but I live in the Antarctic, and that's really not a good car for that area. Um, and then the last one, measurement issues, to actually measure somebody's intention towards something is pretty difficult to do. So those are factors that can actually interfere in the uh, actual action that somebody might take, even if they feel positively and have positive beliefs about something. So to recap, an attitude is an enduring organization of motivational, emotional, perceptual, and cognitive processes. There are three components of attitudes, the beliefs, the feelings, and the intentions. Uh, there is something called the hierarchy of effects, which is the process through which attitudes are formed. 
Cognitive dissonance occurs when there's an imbalance between the beliefs or feelings and or intentions. And there are a few factors, we talked about seven of them, that can influence attitude component consistency. So this is the first uh, PowerPoint about um, attitudes. Make sure you read the text and uh, do the homework. And um, I will have another video about attitudes coming up.